for anyone who's read the seven letters to the seven churches, Laodicea is, uh, it's not the best till last. Let me just put it like that. This is by far the worst church out of the seven. Um, With Sardis, Jesus had something positive to say. What he said to Sardis is, you're dead, you're not alive. However, there are still a few people in the church who have not soiled their garments. There are still few people who are worthy to walk in white with me. So Sardis was in a terrible way, but Jesus said, you have a few Christians. You have a few people washed clean by the blood of Christ. In Laodicea, he has nothing to say. There's just no positive connotation to what this church is doing whatsoever. And so as we start, as I said to you in Sardis, I want to remind you that I'm not standing here outright saying Disciples Church is Laodicea, okay? But what I'm also not outright saying is Disciples Church isn't Laodicea. I believe Jesus said at the end of every letter, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, the church is made up of individuals. We're told in the Bible the church is made up of living stones. Each individual having their own individual walk with Jesus Christ as a living stone coming together, forming the temple of God known as the church, the now place where God's Spirit dwells. Before it was the tabernacle, then it was the temple. Now it's the living temple, the people of God in whom God dwells and manifests himself to the world. But for us to be able to work as a church, each one of us need to not only hear everything we see in the word communally, but we need to hear it individually as well. And so Laodicea has application for DC as a church and quite a strong warning for DC as a church as well. But I believe Laodicea also has a direct message for each and every single one of us. Notice at the end of the letters, Jesus doesn't say, for he who is a church, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Notice how Jesus says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Jesus here is speaking to the church, but addressing every single individual. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So with that being said, let's read the church to Laodicea, then let's pray and then we'll get into the word today. Verse 14 of chapter 3. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works, You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, this is a hefty letter. A difficult letter to hear, Lord. I can't imagine how difficult it must have been for the Laodiceans to read this letter. Lord, I ask that you would bless us today by your Holy Spirit with humble hearts. Not with hard hearts, Lord, but with soft hearts. Humble us, Lord, each one of us individually, that we may be humble as a church. Open up our minds, Lord. Allow us not to clog our ears in order not to hear what your word has to say, but have us hear clearly, have us see clearly. 
Lord, help us to judge ourselves rightly, that as your scriptures say, if we do so, we will not be judged. Lord, help us, please, to accept the teachings of this word, no matter how difficult it may be to hear. Let it sink deep into our hearts and make true radical change that we may become more like you, Lord Jesus. Help us, Lord, today, we ask in Jesus' name, in your precious name. Amen. Okay, let's start. So verse 14, to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. Now, I I know I've repeated myself over the last couple of weeks about this, but the titles given have a great deal of meaning and application to the church he's speaking to. He has chosen to describe himself in ways that speak directly into the circumstances that the church finds itself in. I want a little bit of an example for this. Smyrna, the church in Smyrna, found themselves at death's door. They found themselves quite literally at the edge of being martyred. And Jesus says, I am the one who died and came to life. So he chooses a title to encourage them in their current situation. So let's have a look at the three titles Jesus gives himself here or are given to him. First one is the words of the Amen. The word Amen is what's known as mostly a universal word. What that means is, is Amen is a direct translation from the Hebrew, the Aramaic, the Latin, to the Greek, to the English. It's all just Amen. It's just the same word. It's a universal word. And it carries the same meaning. When we use it at the end of prayers, when we say amen to prayers, what you're saying is, and it amazes me how many people don't know what amen means when they say amen at the end of prayers, what it's saying is, let it be so. Truly, truly, let it be so. That's what amen means. There are some prayers I won't amen because I may not want that to be so. I may not think that's not a biblical prayer, so I won't amen it. When you say amen, you are affirming the prayer. You're saying, truly, truly, let it be so. Amen is also used as an exhortation. In the Gospels, Jesus would say, truly, truly, behold, behold. And what he's actually saying there in the ancient language is, amen, amen. Amen, amen, what I'm about to say is absolutely true. The word amen denotes absolute certainty, absolute firmness, and truth. And so Jesus, as the amen, is communicating to us, I am reliable, constant, unchanging, unwavering, I am certain, I am true. I am the amen. Not a amen, I am the amen. Jesus encapsulates everything that amen means in himself, true and trusted above everything and everyone. He says, I am a faithful and true witness. The word witness here is also the word used for martyr. So he says, I am a faithful and true witness. He also is saying, I am a faithful and true martyr. I gave my life for the church that you may have life. But there's also another meaning to it as well. In the Bible, when God is about to pass down judgment upon a people, whether it be Israel, whether it be the Canaanites, or whether it be the church, when God is about to pass down judgment, he tends to preamble it with something. And what he preambles it with is a character reference. I know that may sound strange, but what God does is, I'm about to give you a statement of judgment, but before I do, let me remind you who I am. Let me remind you of my character. Let me remind you of who I am. This happens in Israel, in Jeremiah 42. Israel have come to realize that God is handing down a judgment upon them through the prophet, and this is what they say. May the Lord be a true and faithful witness against us if we do not act according to all the word with which the Lord your God sends you to us. The Israelites said, let God be the only faithful and true witness against us if we do not heed your word. And so Jesus is about to give a very stern judgment of Laodicea 
And before he does, he says, I want you to know before you read this letter, I am a faithful and true witness. My judgment is true to what I'm saying. There's no doubt about it. I cannot and will not lie. And then he says, I am the beginning of God's creation. Now, as many of you can imagine, this verse has been massively manipulated over the years by people such as the Jehovah Witnesses and other such groups who like to bring about a very particular heresy where Jesus is created. You know, a heresy where he's not God, he's a created being, that is indeed a heresy. And so they take this verse and say, see Aaron, it says he's the beginning of God's creation. So surely that means, what the sentence means is, he was created first. There's actually quite a simple rebuke to this, and maybe something to note down and remember if you ever come across this conversation. The word beginning here is the word archaea. The word archaea is where we get the word architect from. It's the architect of something. Here's another definition of the ancient word archaea. That by which anything begins to be the cause of creation, the beginning of creation, the first place and the ruler. So the word beginning here literally means the cause of creation. What does the Bible say? Nothing is made unless it has been made by Jesus and through Jesus. So when he says, I am the beginning of God's creation, what Jesus is saying here, I'm the architect of God's creation. Nothing has been created unless it has first been created through me. Now, a Jehovah Witness like to say that this means that Jesus was created. Another very simple rebuke you can bring to this, in Revelation 21, 6, people who believe in this heresy will say that this is the Father speaking. And it says, it is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. We've all heard that statement. God says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. They say that's the Father speaking. That's the eternal God. Big problem. Same word. Archaea is the same word used there to describe the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, as it is to describe I am the beginning of God's creation. So once you break down what the words actually mean, it becomes a lot more simple to see what it's actually saying. Jesus is the architect of all of God's creation. As the Bible confirms, nothing has been made that has not been made through him and by him. So why this introduction? Well, for two reasons. First of all, I believe that this is an evangelistic introduction. What I mean by that is I believe Jesus is actually introducing himself to the church. And you may think that's a very strange thing to say. Later on, we're going to find out that Jesus is standing outside the church knocking. He's actually outside the front door saying, hey, church, do you want to let me in? I don't think you quite understand what you're doing here. I'm knocking at the door. And so this is an introduction. I am the amen. Everything that you amen is me. I am the amen. I am the faithful and true martyr. I died for you. I am the faithful and true witness. Everything I say about you is true. I am the beginning of God's creation. I am the architect. The reason that life is here, I am Jesus Christ. Open the door. Knock, knock, knock. And so I see this as an introduction, but I also see it as a rebuke at the same time. Because everything Jesus has just described himself as is everything that this church is completely and absolutely not focusing on. Over and over again, Jesus says, I am faithful, I am trustworthy. Put your trust in me, put your faith in me. And this church are doing everything but that. And so I think that's also why he uses these titles. Let's carry on to verse 15. We'll come back to the titles in a little while. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. If I told you, if you hadn't read the Bible before and I described this loving, 
Lamb of God that came to die for your sins and hung up on the cross for you and loves you so much that he gave his life to you, all of which is true. But then I told you that in the Bible he said this, you know, not my Jesus. My Jesus would never speak to me like this. Well, unfortunately that's wrong. Jesus says, I know your works. That statement brings about an expectation of either reward or judgment. But when Jesus says it, it should bring us to the edge of our seats. I know your works. What is he about to say next? He has said it to every single church. And an application for myself and you, while we're reading about what he says to the seven churches, please do not be mistaken. There is going to be a day that every Christian stands in front of Jesus Christ at the Bema seat, and he's going to say to you, I know your works. And on that day, every single Christian is going to have their works exposed as to whether they were hay and straw and are burnt up, or as to whether they're gold and it survives through the fire. Every single one of us have a day coming where the Lord will tell to us, I know your works. And we will have to see as to whether the works we did for Christ stand the test of the fire or not. Sometimes I think that some of the works that we hold most dear, some of the works that we really feel, do you know what, I just, I just done so much for the Lord in that moment, I'm going to get such a great reward, might just be the works that Jesus is like, nope. Jesus says that if you do anything in this world for the kingdom of God, but you do it for the sight of man, you tell people about it, look what I'm doing, look at me, let me get an audience, look at this great work I'm doing, Jesus says, well done, you've got your reward. That's what you've earned, the praise of man. But when you come to the beamer seat, there'll be nothing waiting for you. You've already had it. I know your works is an antidote for self-righteousness. Because Jesus does not weigh your works up based on your evaluation of them. What you think is precious and what you think isn't. Jesus weighs your works up based on what he thinks. It's an antidote for self righteousness. It should bring about a fear of God, not an arrogance. And this is the verdict of the works of the Laodiceans. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot, so because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. The word cold here in the in the Greek in which it was written, a real amazing translation, it literally means cold, shock horror. But the word hot does actually denote something else. The word hot here, the original word, is used to describe boiling water. It's also the root word for the word zealous. Later on, Jesus is going to say, be zealous and repent. It's the same word being used there, hot. Be hot and repent. Be zealous and repent. Be like boiling water. The idea is that a person is so zealous for Christ that it's bubbling up within them. The Bible says that let your relationship with Jesus overflow to the people around you. Let it be like a sweet fragrance to those around you. There's a zealousness, there's a passion that's bubbling up. And as it bubbles up, it overflows. This is what Jesus is referring to as the person who's hot. The person who's cold is there's nothing. No bubbles, no zealousness, just still water. There's nothing there. The hot is the spirit-filled, zealous, devoted Christian. The cold is the unbeliever. Now, some people don't like that translation. They say, no, I don't believe. I believe cold simply is lukewarm believer. That's a big problem because Jesus here says to the Laodiceans, would that you were rather hot or cold. So if cold means lukewarm believer, what are the Laodiceans then? They're the lukewarm believers. No, cold is unbeliever. Hot is bubbling up, zealous believer. 
And so what are the Laodiceans? Because Jesus here says, you are neither cold nor hot. What on earth does that mean? You are neither zealous, bubbling over, or cold. You are somewhere in between. Now this brings a big problem. Because biblically speaking, there is no in-between. Jesus says you are either of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of Satan. There is no middle ground. You belong to one or you belong to the other, whether you know it or not. There is no middle ground. So when Jesus says, would that you were either hot or cold or cold or hot, what is he saying? Well, my interpretation for you to weigh and test is in the eyes of Christ, there's only one thing worse than someone not having any faith at all. And that's someone having a hypocritical faith. Let me explain what I mean using the Gospels. When Jesus walked on the, on the earth, who did he speak most, I don't want to use the word in a negative sense, I use it in a positive one because there was no sin in it, but who did he speak to most harshly? Who did he rebuke the sternest? Pharisees. Who did he, he never said to the builder down the road who wasn't a believer, you're a child of the devil. He said to the Pharisees, you're children of the devil. He said to the Pharisees, you do your father's work, the devil's work. He said to the Pharisees, you're whitewashed sepulchers. Who is it that Jesus spoke the harshest to? It was those who had the appearance of godliness but internally, nothing was there. They had the expression of faith. They had the expression of zealousness. But inside, there was no Christ. Jesus said to them, you wash the outside of the cup. But the inside is filthy. Wash the inside of the cup that the outside of it might be clean as well. Jesus said, you hypocrites. There's only one thing worse than someone who doesn't have any faith. And that's someone who has a hypocritical faith. Someone who has a pretense of faith. I've said it many times in this church. It is so much harder to evangelize someone who thinks they are saved than it is to evangelize someone who knows they're not. It is almost impossible. With the unbeliever, you can say, you're not a Christian, I'm not a Christian. Let me tell you about Jesus. Fair enough, let's go. But with the person who believes they're a Christian, does all of the Christian things, how can you save someone who doesn't think they need to be saved? It's a very difficult thing to do. The Laodicean church, by many commentators, has been labelled the church of tares. If you remember the story in the Bible of the wheat and the tares, and the angel comes and says, shall we separate the wheat from the tares? And Jesus says, no, let them grow up together. And then on the day of the Lord, the angel will come and separate the wheat and separate the tares. Let them grow up together. Laodicea is a church of tares. There is no Christ in it. As we'll see later on, he is outside knocking. All the prayers, all the worship songs, hands held high, so-called fellowship afterwards. Jesus is outside saying, what are you doing? You're worshipping me. I'm not even in the room. What are you actually worshipping? And we'll find out in a minute. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, because you are lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now it gets even more serious because the word spit here is not the word spit. It's actually the word vomit. Jesus says, I will vomit you out of my mouth. If I can be as bold as I'm, I feel comfortable, Jesus says, you're making me sick. You make me sick. And I want to vomit you out. 
Now, this sentence has a great deal of meaning. The church is known as the bride of Christ, but it's also known as the body of Christ. Now, every time I try and bring some NHS medical knowledge into a sermon, I end up failing miserably. So I'm going to try and keep this as safely as surely. My mum's a nurse. She's up front. She's got her eye on me. But I'm fairly sure, correct me if I'm wrong, that when the body vomits, (laughs) I'm already nervous doing it, it's because something in the body is not meant to be there. A bug, an infection, an illness. We good? Well done, nod. Okay, fantastic. So something is in the body that is not meant to be there. It's harmful to the body. It's harming the body. And so the body has an incredible, not very pleasant, but an incredible God-given self-defense mechanism where it throws up to get whatever is inside out the body to protect the body. Jesus here is doing the same thing. I need to protect the reputation of my church. I need to protect my body. I need to protect my people. If you don't repent, I'm going to throw you up. You're out. If you don't heed what I'm saying to you, if you don't open the door and let me in, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Imagine being the Laodicean church and reading this. It's going to bring two reactions about that we'll talk about later. Let's carry on. For you say, this is Jesus talking to them now. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Before we carry on, as you know I like to do with these churches, I want to bring in a little bit of historical context to what Laodicea was actually like as a city. And the reason being is much of what Jesus speaks into this city has to do with the culture that surrounds it. So I just want to bring a few contexts into this sermon that will help you understand why Jesus is about to use some of the descriptions he's about to use. He is actually, believe it or not, directly speaking into the culture of the city that the church is in. And I'll show you how in a minute. Laodicea was known as one of the richest cities in the Roman Empire. It was a banking center of the Roman Empire. And it was, had massive amounts of commerce going through. So it was quite literally one of the richest cities. To give you an idea of how rich this city was... In AD 37, there was an earthquake. And the earthquake destroyed about 10, 12 cities in the area, and Laodicea was one of them. Now, the Romans, like many governments, had this support system that if an earthquake happened and destroyed the city, the Roman Empire would send an ambassador, and they would offer the city a large amount of money to rebuild it. It was kind of like this help scheme the government had at that time. Laodicea is the only city in the area at AD 37 who said to the Roman ambassador, we don't want any of your money. We are going to rebuild this whole city by ourselves. All of the people collected what they had and they rebuilt the city by their own finances. They were the only city to do it. In AD 60... Less than 30 years later, another earthquake struck and destroyed the city. And the Laodiceans once again said, nope, we don't need any money from anyone. We ourselves will rebuild it. And there's lots of plaques that have been found on many of the temples and many of the buildings saying, rebuilt by the people and by the people's money. Literally, they put plaques on buildings just so everyone knew we done this. We didn't need any help. So this was how affluent the area was. This is how unbelievably affluent it was. It was also a city, and this is going to be very important coming in later on, it was a city with a booming business of both clothes and medical things as well. They had a medical college in the city of Laodicea, and what the medical college specifically worked on and this is going to come in later, it was known to work on eye ointments. The medical college in Laodicea was incredibly advanced in putting things together to help eyes which were irritated or infected. It also had a booming business of black sheepskins. 
For some strange reason around their area, there was a great deal of black sheep, and so they had a lot of black sheepskins, these very rare, very expensive clothings. It was like the Gucci of the ancient world to be wearing these like black sheepskins. So very fine clothing, very advanced medicine, a rich banking center. Starting to sound familiar? The name Laodicea literally means the people rule. That's what the main name Laodicea means. The people rule. It's mob. It's not, it's not clear leadership. It's mob rule. We have the power. We'll do what we want in our city. Antichius the Great named the city after his wife. His wife's name was Laodicea. He then divorced his wife and then years later got back with his wife and one day Antichius the Great was found dead and many historians believe that his wife, who he divorced and got back with, literally poisoned him. Any husbands who have their wives joke around about, you carry on, I'm going to poison your dinner. Antichius the Great actually fell to that. But Laodicea was named after his wife. The whole entire point was his wife was a beautiful lady and he wanted the city to be known for her beauty. And so it was a city in every single essence of the word, even in the origin of the name, which was all about glorifying human beings, glorifying people. So going back to what Jesus said with that context in mind, this is a city whose appearance is far more important than substance. The appearance of the city was more important than the substance of the city. So taking that context in hand, let us go back to what Jesus says. For the church who's in the middle of Laodicea, this booming, banking, rich, profitable city, he says, you say... I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. This church considered themselves rich off one thing and one thing only, the material possession in which they had. They considered riches in the same way that the world considers riches. Jesus said to the Smyrna church, that despite you being in absolute poverty, materially, you're rich. But he says to the Laodicean church, despite you having everything materially, you're desperately poor. Why? Because Jesus is referring to the spiritual state of the church. Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters. For he he will either hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You cannot serve God and money. The Laodiceans had replaced their God with the God of gold, the God of mammon, of money. We are rich. I wonder how many would be challenged by a message like this who believe in what is called the prosperity gospel. Believe in Jesus and you will be made rich. If you're not rich, it's because you're not following Jesus in the way you should. What would the prosperity preachers have said to Smyrna? What would they have said to Ephesus? They would have walked into Laodicea and said, bless. Blessed church, everyone. These are real Christians. Look at what God's given them. And God is standing outside saying, you're really, really poor. You have no idea how poor you actually are. They go on to say, I have prospered. The word prospered there literally means to have lots of resources, to have grown wealthy. This could have potentially have been a mega church. This could very well have been a very popular, a thriving church with a great deal of resources and a great deal of money. Because the church is not saying here, we don't have many people in the congregation. It's saying here, we've grown. We're prospering. Once again, look how God is blessing us. 
Look how many people are in this hall with all of these fine things around us. And then they said potentially the most revealing thing of their hearts, and I need nothing. Self-sufficiency is by far one of the most unchristlike qualities a person can have. Self-sufficiency is completely and absolutely unbiblical. Now, let me clarify what I mean. If you're paying your bills on a monthly basis and you work hard and you manage to keep up with your mortgage and everything else, you could technically say, I'm self-sufficient. Yeah, okay, but praise God for the job. Praise God for the hours. Praise God for the house. Praise God for the heating. Praise God for the electricity. You're not self-sufficient. You wouldn't have it if God didn't give it to you. The Bible says every good and perfect gift comes from above. So self-sufficiency is the opposite of Christian living. Someone might say, guys, I don't need your help. I've got this by myself. That's not what the Bible teaches. Bear one another's burdens. Look out for each other. Love one another. Pray for each other. Help each other. Serve each other. Outdo each other in showing honor. This is not a self-sufficient lifestyle. Self-sufficiency is just a more subtle version of pride. You might not want to be seen by everyone, and therefore you think, well, I'm not prideful. No, if you're self-sufficient, if you go down this route of being self-sufficient, you are entering into a dangerous place of pride, a much more subtle place of pride. We are not called to be self-sufficient. We are called to rely on God first and foremost. And then as a church, we are called to rely on each other. It's what the Bible teaches. And this church turned around to Jesus and says, I need nothing. I'm all good. Deuteronomy 8 verse 11, God gives a warning Moses, God through Moses, gives a warning to Israel. And this is what he says. This is so important, I believe, for the Laodiceans, and it's so important for us. Listen to what God says to Israel. Beware, that first word, beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his judgments, his statutes. And I command you today, listen to what it says next. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built beautiful houses and dwell in them and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold are multiplied, all that you have has prospered when your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led you through that great and terrible wilderness in which fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty land where there was no water, who brought water for you out of the rock. Do you know what God's saying to Israel? When you have that running water and all of those wells, don't you ever forget there was a time that I had to feed you off a rock. When you've got all of the food, don't you ever forget there was a time that manna had to come up from the ground. And when you live in the safety of your beautiful house, don't you ever forget that it was me who protected you from the Amalekites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, and the Moabites. When you get plenty, don't forget where you came from. A Christian is not meant to grow in self-righteousness or self-dependence or self-sufficiency. A Christian is meant to grow in humility. The more you mature in Christ, the more you need to be saying, I need you all the more. The more you mature in Christ isn't the better you think about yourself. The more you mature in Christ is how much more you realize how much of a sinner you actually were. The more you mature in Christ is when you realize just how saved you actually are and just what you're saved from. These Laodiceans had gone in a very, very, very different direction. I need nothing. There is a difficult prayer to pray in Proverbs 30. 
Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and still and profane the name of the Lord. Proverbs says this, Don't make me rich. Keep me from being poor. Keep me in the place where I am constantly dependent on you. Now up to us, we might say, well, Lord, you know, keep me from being rich, but one million doesn't go very far this much, Lord. You know, one million, I'm not technically rich, so give me one million and I'll still be okay. The Lord knows what you need. He doesn't give you what you want. Be very careful when you pray. It's, it's okay, by the way, to pray for financial help. It's okay to pray to the Lord for finances. That's absolutely fine. Some reason people think it's like a taboo subject. Of course you can pray to the Lord about your finances. But what I would suggest you pray at the end, let your will be done, despite what I'm praying. For you say I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. And this is where the truth comes in, and the truth hurts. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. He starts by saying you are wretched. The word wretched here is the word teleporus, which means you are troubled, you are afflicted. The gold that they had was such a reassurance to them. Jesus says the gold, the, the black sheepskin, the eye ointment, the riches you have, it's not helping you, it's afflicting you. It's actually afflicting you. You're wretched because of it. He says you're not realizing these things. These people were spiritually blind. They didn't even realize their current condition. He says, you're pitiable. The word pitiable is the word eleneos, which means to be miserable. Jesus says, you're miserable. Do you know Proverbs says that the poor man sleeps well at night, but the rich man stays up all night worrying about his riches, counting every penny. The poor man who's been on the building site all day and lives by day by day, he comes home and has the best night's sleep ever. What's he got to worry about? The rich man comes home and spends all night long worrying about what's in his bank account. Jesus says, you're miserable. You're pitiable. The joy they had was a pretense. What was going on underneath was very different. I love this. He says, you're wretched, you're pitiable, you're poor. <coughs> he says, you're poor. You can, you can imagine the Laodiceans asking the Lord, how are we poor? Look around, Lord. Look at what I'm wearing, Lord. Look at the building I'm in. Look at the congregation. How are we poor? How could you say that? We've got multi, multi-million pounds in the bank account. We've got churches left, right and centre. How can you possibly say we're poor? Because the Lord is talking about a very different riches that they did not have. And then he says, you are blind. You are blind. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says, In their case, the God of this world, talking about Satan, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. In John 9, he says, For judgment I came into the world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Guess who answers the question? The Pharisees say, Are we blind? And Jesus says, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. Notice what Jesus is saying to the Pharisees. What he's saying to the Pharisees is, if you admitted to me that you're blind, you would have no guilt. You would just need me, I would open your eyes and you would be able to see. But it's because you say you see that the guilt remains on you. What the Pharisees were doing, it's because you say you're saved. It's because you say you know God that the guilt remains. And then last one, he says, you are poor, wretched, pitiable, blind, and naked. You are naked. And once again, with the Laodiceans clothed in all of this fine clothing, you can imagine what on earth is the Lord 
talking about? How can we possibly be naked? Look at the clothes we have on. <coughs> Nakedness in the Bible was not originally intended to bring about an understanding of shame. But unfortunately, according to the fall in Genesis chapter 3, we see that when Adam and Eve sinned against God, they were suddenly aware of their own nakedness. And it says shame fell upon them. They had sinned against God and shame fell upon them because of their nakedness. And ever since in the Bible, ever since that moment, nakedness has always been a sign of shame. And very interestingly enough, Satan tempted Eve with the same temptations he has destroyed the Laodicean church with. Something that was a delight to the eyes, the gold, the silver, the riches, something that could satisfy her material wants, her stomach. These guys were fully fed, they were absolutely fine. And something that could make her wise, build her self-sufficiency. The Laodiceans and Eve's temptation go hand in hand. Satan had used the same old trick against them as he's been using on people since the beginning of creation. And so being naked not only meant they were ashamed, but it has a very important meaning. And this is how we know that these, these people were not believers. Because being naked meant that they were not clothed in Christ. Everywhere in Revelation, we hear about believers being clothed with white garments, garments clothed by Christ. These people themselves may have been clothed materially, but they were not clothed spiritually. They were naked in their sins. They were in the same place Adam and Eve with, completely in sin, completely ashamed, completely guilt-ridden, and they had no covering of God. Jesus says, you're naked. There's no white garments to be seen. White garments being what Jesus offers the believer to cover their sin. Taking away the filthy garments and giving them new garments. Jesus' evaluation of the church was very, very different or opposite, in fact, to the Laodiceans' evaluation of their church. Notice what they said about themselves and what Jesus said about them are quite literally on two opposite ends. We've got to be very careful that we don't fall into the trap of feeling really good about ourselves as to where we're at. It would be much safer to continually come before the Lord and asking him to reveal to us where we're at. Asking him to work on us, to shape us, to build us as a church and individually. But here is the answer to the predicament that these people find themselves in. Here is the answer to this wretched, pitiful state of the church. Verse 18. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourselves and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Notice, please, how Jesus is speaking into the culture. Gold, it's the banking center of the Roman Empire. Buy your riches from me. Clothes, the black sheepskin, the rich clothes. Buy your clothes from me. The eye ointment that Laodicea was literally known for. Let me give you the eye ointment that will truly heal your eyes. Everything he is doing is speaking into the current culture of Laodicea at the time they're at. Stop going to those who offer you material things. Stop finding your trust, your joy, your pleasure in what Laodicea can offer you. Find everything in what I can offer you. What Laodicea can offer you is temporary. What I can offer you is eternal. Choose me, not them. And that's why he also uses a trader's kind of language here. Notice how he starts. I counsel you to buy from me. He's literally spe he's becoming all things for the sake of the gospel. I counsel you to buy from me. It was a booming commercial center of the Roman Empire. Massive amounts of commerce. Jesus says, stop spending things on that. Buy from me instead. And what does he say to buy? Gold refined by fire. Gold refined by fire. 
Gold is talked about in the New Testament, the spiritual sense of the word, as the good works of those who follow Christ. Basically, what Jesus says is true riches. Not the riches that can be accumulated in your bank account, but the riches that can be had by knowing, believing, and following the Lord Jesus Christ. Buy from me gold, tested by fire. Now, some people have said, Aaron, why does Jesus say buy from me? Because we know that salvation is free. And this can be proven. In Ephesians 2, it literally says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So salvation is free. But Jesus says, buy from me gold refined by fire. Let me put it to you like this. Salvation is free, but it has a cost. You're thinking, what? (laughs) Salvation in itself is free, but it can cost everything. Let me give you an example of what I mean. In fact, I don't have to look much further than my own wife. When Haley, my wife, first came into the kingdom of God, she received free salvation by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. But directly after receiving free salvation by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, she straight away, literally her first day into the kingdom of God, she straight away encountered both subtle and not so subtle persecution from the vast majority of her family. And for the next two years afterwards, it was an incredibly difficult time for her. It cost her friends, it cost her family, it cost her socially, and it cost her emotionally sometimes to see those you love most turn against you simply because you love Jesus. So she had a free gift, but she entered into the kingdom and went directly into fire. It was free, but it did cost at the same time. And that's the same for every single one of us. Jesus says, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. If they hated me, they're going to hate you. He actually says, every single Christian will face persecution. There's a cost. But the salvation itself is free. So buy from me gold refined by fire. This gold refined by fire as well is a much better standard of gold than what the Laodiceans were offering them. They're just offering you gold. I'm offering you purer gold, better gold, true riches. And then he says, buy from me white garments so that you may clothe yourself. Once again, white garments refer to someone having the filthy garments of sin removed from them and the white garments of Christ placed upon them, clothed in Christ, is what Christians call it from the biblical term. We get this from Zechariah 3. It says, Now Joshua was standing before the angel, clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken your sin away from you, and I will clothe you with pure garments. The word there is white garments, washed clean by the blood of Christ. I love that, by the way. Notice he doesn't put the white garments on you to cover what's underneath. He takes what's underneath away and then clothes you afresh. It's not like Christians are walking around trying to, you know, we're we're just simply hiding. No, the old man dies and a new man is born, a new creation. When Jesus says, take from me white garments, he is absolutely offering to this church salvation. Come to me, I will wipe away your sin, throw it as far east as is west and remember it no more and clothe you with white garments so that you will no longer be naked, so that you will no longer be ashamed because of your sin. And then the last one he says, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Remember what I said, Laodicea, medical innovation, these eye ointments that the Laodicea was famous for. Jesus says, forget that. I can give you eye salve. I can give you an eye anointment 
that you will actually cure your blindness. Take from me the spiritual salve for your eyes that you may see for the first time. If they accept Jesus Christ and they accept his offer, the first thing they will see is their own sinfulness. If they accept it, the first thing they will see is the condition in which they really are. And when they see the condition in which they really are, it will lead them to cry out to Jesus, save me. At the moment, these people can't be saved for one reason. They don't think they need to be. If I went and preached this message to Laodicea 2,000 years ago, the congregation probably would have kicked me out halfway, but the congregation would have said to me, we don't need to hear this message. We are nothing like Laodicea. And I would say, but you are Laodicea. (laughs) We're nothing like them. We don't need this. We're good. Look how God has blessed us. And I would say back, look how Satan has blessed you. Satan is more than happy to bless people as long as it keeps them from Jesus Christ. And I say bless in the evil term. He's more than happy to make someone rich if those riches keep them blind to salvation. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. I love this line. Because this is by far the harshest rebuke of Christ we've seen so far. But Jesus does not leave them with it. He says, everything I'm saying to you, I'm saying it to you because I love you. He seasons the entire letter with love. They're reading, they're reading, they're reading, they're thinking, oh my goodness. And then at the end, Jesus says, listen to me, Laodicea. I am speaking this truthfully to you. I am speaking this directly to you because I love you. It's because I love you that I'm telling you this difficult truth. And that's why a lot of Christians in this world have got very, very wrong. Aaron, we can't talk about judgment. We can't talk about sin. We can't talk about particular sinful groups or sinful activities or sinful areas in this world. We can't talk about it, Aaron, because God's a God of love. And we need to just make people feel welcome and feel comfortable and feel happy. They want to come here every Sunday and have a community center. We need to love them into heaven, Aaron. I doubt any one of you can tell me that you've loved anyone more than Jesus has. And Jesus says in this letter, I speak the truth because I love you. There are churches of thousands of people that every Sunday continue to lull them to sleep. All in the idea of loving them. Not knowing that they're loving them to hell. They're loving them to judgment. And in fact, they don't love them, they hate them. Because if they loved them, they would say what Jesus says. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous. Once again, that word zealous is the root word hot. Be hot, be zealous and repent. The word reprove here literally means to show one's faults, to call to account, to reprimand, and by conviction, to bring something to the light. That's what the word reprove means. To bring something to the light, to reprimand, and to show one's faults. Not for the purpose of just simply doing it in a judgmental way, but for the purpose of restoring them. Jesus Christ is all about restoration, all about reconciliation. Jesus loves them so much he's willing to have the most difficult conversations with them. Hebrews 12, 6 to 11 echoes this. It says, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son he receives. By the way, there is such an important lesson here in verse 8 of Hebrews 12. It says, If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, 
then you are illegitimate children and not sons. The Bible says, if you haven't experienced God's discipline in your life, which all of us have experienced in one way, shape or the other, you are illegitimate children, not sons or daughters. This is how important God's discipline actually is in our lives. He's a good father. Every good father sets boundaries for their children. Why on earth would the greatest father who has ever been not do the same? The only difference is an earthly father sets boundaries according to what he best knows. God sets boundaries perfectly. So be zealous and repent. Now, there are two heart responses to a message like this. Two heart responses. One, a hardening of the heart. One response is you will read a letter like this addressed to your church and the entire church in a prideful ignorance will harden their heart, probably somehow, shape or form, just declaim the Apostle John and tell us that he's not a real apostle. And they will basically ignore the message and their hearts will only grow harder. The second response is a deep conviction of sin a zealous desire to be made right before God, which leads you to kneel before the feet of Jesus Christ and repent of your sins. A zealousness to be forgiven before God. We have an example of this in the Old Testament. Uh, one of the tribes of Israel, Ephraim, example of a response to God's correction. This is what Ephra Ephraim said. God said, I have heard you grieving. You say, you have disciplined me and I was disciplined. Like an untrained animal, bring me back that I may be restored, for you are the Lord my God. For after I had turned away, I relented, and after I was instructed, I struck my chest. I was ashamed and I was confounded because I bore the disgrace of my youth. Listen to what God says to this response. Is not Ephraim my dear son? Is he my darling child? For as often as I have rebuked him, I do remember him still. Therefore, my, this is God speaking, my heart yearns for him and I will surely have mercy on him, declares the Lord. The Bible teaches that God has never and will never turn away a truly contrite and repentant heart. God hates pride. But when someone humbles themselves, comes before God Almighty and says, I acknowledge the conviction of my sin. I acknowledge what you have been saying to me. Forgive me, Lord, for I want to be made right before you. God has never and will never turn that person away. Never. And then we have possibly the most shocking statement. We're coming near to the end now. Jesus nearly finishes with this. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Where is Jesus standing? Outside. The whole entire service is missing what it's all about, who it's all about. Jesus. What a terrifying thing that is to think of a church who have their hands up worshipping Jesus and he's outside knocking, let me in. <laughs> who are they worshipping? Who are they following? What are they doing? If Jesus isn't there, it's just a bunch of people with no life inside of them like a community hall or a community centre. You might as well be playing dodgeball, doing anything else other than praying and worship because it's pointless without Christ. There's a key parts of this I want to quickly point out to you. First of all, notice what he says. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Listen to this. If anyone hears my voice. That's strange. Jesus says, I'm knocking. So if you hear my voice open, the knocking and the voice are the same thing. 
I stand at the door and knock, hear my voice and open the door. The point is, hear what I'm saying to you. Listen to the word of God. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. Faith comes by hearing God speak directly into your life. The second thing I want you to notice is Jesus here does not speak to the church. He speaks to the individual. Notice, he is saying to this mega church in Laodicea, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, listen, if anyone hears my voice, not, not Laodicea, if anyone in Laodicea hears my voice, I open the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Jesus is crying out, not to Laodicea, if Laodicea hear my voice and open the door. He's crying out to the individuals in Laodicea. He's crying out to the individual men and women in the church. Any single one of you at any point can open the door to me and I will come into your life. It doesn't matter what the pastor's preaching. It doesn't matter how grand the church looks. It doesn't matter if you even have to leave the church. I'm calling to you individually. Hear me, Laodiceans. I stand at the door of your lives and I knock and any one of you that opens, I will come in. Notice all it takes is for one Christian to be in the room for Christ to be in the church, by the way. All it takes is one. One Laodicea needed to open that door and Christ was in. Why? Because the church is not these beams or these walls or this floor, this pulpit, these mics. You and I are the church. So the second that individual, even if one person out of 2,000 open their life to Christ, in that church instantly Christ is there. Because he's in that person. That person has now become part of the church. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The word come into him is the word akasamea. All these words sound the same when I say them. I might be pronouncing them completely wrong. But akasamea means this. It is used to describe God filling a person's body with his presence. It is used to describe God making a house or a home with a person. And I, and I, I want to be so unbelievably careful with this, so please hear what I'm saying. It is also the same word used to describe possession of a different sort. But the reason I say that is because while that is a different sort of possession, the point here is I'm going to come and fill your body. The presence of God through the Holy Spirit will come and live within you. Within your very body itself. And then he says, once I will do that, I will eat with him and he with me. The idea of eating is one of the closest signs of fellowship a person could have in the ancient world was sharing a meal with someone. That's why the Pharisees said to Jesus, why is it that you eat with these tax collectors and these prostitutes? How could you possibly eat with these people? It's because what he was doing was showing such a closeness of fellowship and they couldn't believe that he would have a meal. Talk to them on the street, fine, but you have a meal with them? You eat with them? That's only reserved for the closest of friends, for the closest of family. Jesus says, if you open that door to me, I will come into you and I will eat with you and you will eat with me. Another verse that says this in John 14, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. We will make our home with him. And before we go to the last verse, and I know we're running over a little bit, before we go to the last verse, in this one verse about opening the door is the gospel message summed up. Ever since the beginning of humanity, it has been God's desire to tabernacle with his people. When Adam and Eve were in the garden, it tells us that God used to walk in the garden in the cool of day. He used to walk with his people. There was an intimate fellowship with humanity. Adam and Eve fell. They sinned against God and sin separated them from that fellowship. And God, ever since, has been working to reconcile what was broken back in Genesis 3. With Moses, he set up a tent called a tabernacle and God's presence used to fill the tabernacle. And Moses would come in and speak to God face to face. 
Later on, under King Solomon, he built a temple, a place that would just stay where it is. And God's presence used to fill the temple so he could meet with his people. All he ever wanted, all he's ever wanted, is to fellowship with his creation, to have a tabernacling relationship with people. But there was a problem over and over and over and over again. The sin of humanity continually kept God from being able to do it in the way he wanted to. In the end, in Ezekiel, he actually leaves the temple. He literally leaves it because of the abominations that they've done in it. He actually, his presence lifts up out of the temple and moves because he says, I cannot bear to be near these people anymore, which is a heartbreaking thing because that's his sole desire is to have a relationship with you as son and daughter. But our sin is what stops it. So what did God do? Instead of looking for the external, God solved the internal problem, the sin within us. He sent his only son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to live the perfect life that you and I couldn't live, to die on a cross, taking upon himself not only your sin, but your shame, your guilt, and not only that, but taking upon himself the judgment of God that we deserve. And after three days resurrecting, bringing anyone who believes in him into new life. And then, and only then, God could tabernacle with humanity in a way that throughout the entire Bible hadn't been possible. When the Spirit of God literally comes to live within a person. You can't get closer to God than God literally living inside of you. (laughs) That was the purpose from the very beginning. And now we have a brighter hope. For at the moment we have the invisible God living inside of us that we fellowship with every day, but we have a brighter hope that there's even a next stage of tabernacling, there's even a next stage of closeness, and that is when we see him face to face and we will not depart from him neither day nor night. We will be with him forever, just as they were in the garden, walking with him in the cool of day for all eternity. This is what you were created for, by the way. Just thought I'd answer the meaning of life while we're here. (laughs) This is what you were created for. Everything you were created for, everything you were created for was to know and tabernacle with God Almighty. He doesn't doesn't want to just know you as creation. (coughs) Cats, dogs, whales, sheep. He doesn't just want to know you as creation. He wants to know you as father, son, father, daughter. Why do you think God gives us such intimate descriptions of the church? A bride of Christ, a child of God, a brother to Jesus, a friend. Why do you think God uses all of these descriptions? He's trying to tell you something. This is what I desired from the very beginning. And now it's only through, and always has been, only through Jesus Christ that this can be made possible. I Stand at the door and knock. Open and I will come into you, eat with you and you with me. And if you're asking Aaron, how do I open that door? There's no manual I'm going to give you. There's no leaflet. There's no special words. Cry out to Jesus Christ and ask him to come into your life. That's the prayer I prayed, the prayer many of us prayed. And sometimes we pray it in different ways. That is opening the door when God gives you the faith to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you open it to him. I love the fact, by the way, that Jesus doesn't kick it down. Sometimes over some of my family members, I wish he did, just kick kick the door down, Lord, just (laughs) smash the door to oblivion and just force them, grab them and let's go. But he doesn't, he doesn't kick it down. He just patiently knocks over and over and over and over again. And he will knock until the day they die. But when they die, the knocking stops. There is no longer a door. And the only thing that waits for them is judgment. That's why he keeps on knocking. Knock, 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 knock. Is he knocking on your life today? If he is, I'd put money on the fact that it's not the first time. He's probably been knocking for a long, long time. Last verse, 
verse 21. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers. Romans 8 says, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. The Christian is the conqueror. We are a conqueror because Christ has conquered and when we are in Christ, his victory is imparted to us. As I've said time and time again, the church is simply an army parade proclaiming a victory. We're not going to war. The war's been won. We're proclaiming the victory that has been won through Christ. And there are many forces in this world that want to try and stop us proclaiming that victory or change the message of that victory. We must stay faithful to what the victory is. And Jesus says, lastly, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Now, I'm very aware that we've gone quite over the time and this is a massive topic. We will be covering this a bit later on. 38 times in Revelation, thrones are mentioned in reference to Christ or God. 38 times. The book of Revelation can be summed up in this way. The book of Revelation is about the coming king and his throne being set up on earth. Now, something I want to quickly introduce you to that we're going to cover a bit more later on, so I'm quite happy to rush past this a little bit. There are two thrones. One is the throne of God in heaven that Jesus says, I now sit at the right hand of my father on his throne. Two is the Davidic throne. The Davidic throne is the throne of David that God says will be on the earth and Christ will reign on forever. Jesus has not yet received the Davidic throne. He currently sits at the right hand side of his father in heaven. He has not yet received the throne on earth. That is why we pray Hallowed be thy name, your kingdom come, your will be done. There is a day coming when Jesus will receive the Davidic throne and he will will rule the nations with a rod of iron upon it. This is why God says, sit with me until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Davidic throne of Jesus starts with the millennium kingdom, the thousand year reign of Christ. That is when the Davidic throne on earth starts and it will never go again. At the moment, the only throne we hear about on earth is Satan's. And so a false king needs to be disposed before the true king can take his throne on this earth. Jesus, unsurprisingly, is not willing to share with Satan his throne and dominion over this earth. So there is a difference. When he says, look what he says, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. And something beautiful happens later on in Revelation. All the way through Revelation, we hear these two different thrones being mentioned. And then in Revelation 20, 21, these two thrones become one explaining how Jesus said, I and the Father are one, never separate, one and the same. One of the amazing promises about this is Jesus says, I will have the conqueror sit with me on my throne. What this is referring to is how the saints are going to rule with Christ during that thousand year reign of Christ. It says in Revelation 20, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. And that he must be released, then he must be released for a little while. Now listen to this. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. 
Also, I saw souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and for those who had not worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. Listen to this last line. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Revelation talks about there being thrones in which saints are placed upon to rule alongside Christ for a thousand years. Laodicea received the greatest rebuke and the greatest promise all at the same time. They received the greatest rebuke But if they adhered to his words and took his warning and repented and were zealous and turned for for their sin to him, they would receive the greatest reward. For what reward is there that is greater than, as Revelation says, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years? I don't even know what that looks like. (laughs) All I know is that's what the Bible says. So there is a difference between the Davidic throne and the throne of God in heaven. And we will talk a lot more about that. 38 times thrones is mentioned in Revelation. We're not going to be able to escape this understanding of thrones as we move on. I would have preferred to have spent a bit more time, but I have gone well over. So we're going to start with, he. we're going to finish with, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And I have three questions for you to consider today. Are you at a boiling point in your walk? Are you zealous? Are you bubbling over? Are you hot on fire for the Lord? If the Lord was to evaluate your walk with him, is it one that expresses this bubbling over of zealous desire for him? Or are you dangerously, dangerously getting colder and colder? Have the bubbles maybe not bubbled as much as they used to and it's becoming a bit more still than it ever was before? And that lukewarmness is setting in. This world will give you multiple reasons to be lukewarm. Only the word of God will give you reasons to be hot and zealous. Second question is, is your life hidden in Christ? Is Jesus inside of you or is he standing outside knocking? The question is really simple. Are you a Christian? I'll put it like that. Are you a Christian? Do you have the life of Christ inside of you? Or has a pretense, has a pretense and a mirage defined your Christianity? It's a hard one to judge, but Paul says, judge yourselves, test yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. How do you do that? Go to the Bible. Look at what a Christian is. Look at what a Christian does. Look at the fruits of a Christian's life and test yourselves. Three, is God disciplining you in an area of your life? Is there something where God's discipline is weighing heavy on your soul, on your conscience? If so, what is your response? Are you growing hard-hearted towards it? Are you trying to flee from it? Or are you willing to humble yourself? Repent and come to the Lord Jesus Christ and be washed clean and changed. Remember the word repentance is a 180 degree turn in the opposite direction. And it all starts before Jesus Christ in admittance and repentance. It's a difficult message. It's a difficult sermon. It's a difficult letter. But just remember this. Jesus says, I say all of these things for one sole reason. I love you. That is why. I love you. This is the evidence. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, first of all, for the patient grace that my brothers and sisters show me. I thank you, Lord, for their attentiveness, despite the time we've been here. And I thank you, Lord, for this message. And I thank you for this letter to Laodicea. Lord, I pray, Heavenly Father, you would help us. That you would reveal yourselves to us. 
that you, my Lord, would show us the areas in which we need change, in which we need discipline, in which we need conviction. I pray, Lord, that if any of us are being convicted in a certain area, that we would not run from it. Lord, humble us. Allow us to be Christ-like. Heavenly Father, if we have begun to depend on material things and the world around us, if we have begun to think that we're self-sufficient, self-proficient, that we need nothing, that we're rich, help us to understand, Lord, that we are most probably poor, pitiable, that we need you more than ever. Help us never to be self-sufficient. Help us never to be subtly prideful. Help us to live according to your word, to live according to your spirit, Help us, Heavenly Father, to hear the difficult things and not reject them. And I thank you, Lord, that all of this is surrounded and seasoned by the fact that you love us. We thank you for your love, Lord Jesus. Lord, you are doing wonderful things in Disciples Church, and we see them, Lord, and we see how the growth has come. But I do ask and pray, Heavenly Father, that you would never allow this church, ever, 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 allow this church to get to the size, to get to the point, to get to the riches of having forgotten you. I would rather, Lord, we never grew in number ever again and we stayed exactly the same financially as we are right now than ever we forget you as a church. For all of its days, Lord, until you come or until we're raptured, I ask, Lord Jesus, you would keep disciples' church, knowing you humble, dependent, sufficient with you and not on ourselves. This is only possible by your Spirit. For whoever comes after me, for whoever's before me, Lord, for all of us here, Keep Disciples Church until the end of time, Lord, in a place where you want us to be, which is on our knees depending on you daily. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.